This is ESG Decoded, the podcast powered by Global Affairs Associates to provide relevant, actionable updates related to business innovation and sustainability. Join Caitlin Allen and Amanda Shea of Global Affairs Associates for thoughtful, nuanced conversations with industry leaders that explore the complexities, the risks, and the opportunities connected to all things ESG. I'm Yvonne Harris, a consultant and co-host, and I will be collaborating with Caitlin and Amanda for the discussions that we will present on this podcast. Put simply, ESG is everything that is not on your balance sheet. This leaves room for misunderstanding, oversimplification, and the tendency towards one-size-fits-all perspectives. None of that will happen on this podcast. Enjoy this episode. Hi, this is Caitlin Allen, and I'm here today with Pavel Molchanov of Raymond James. Pavel joined Raymond James and Associates in 2003 and has been part of the energy research team ever since. He became an analyst in 2006, the year he initiated coverage on the renewable energy and clean technology sectors. In this role, he covers all aspects of sustainability-themed technologies, including solar, wind, biofuels, electric vehicles, hydrogen, power storage, grid modernization, water technology, and more. Within the energy research team, he also writes about the broader topics of geopolitical and regulatory issues, climate change, and ESG investing. He's been recognized in the Starmine Top Analyst Survey, the Forbes Blue Chip Analyst Survey, and the Wall Street Journal Best on the Street Survey. Pavel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. First, I just have to say thank you because... (laughs) We at Global Affairs Associates have appeared on a couple of Raymond James investor calls hosted by Pavel and, and his team. So thank you for agreeing to reciprocate and provide some of your own insights today on ESG Decoded. So ESG investing continues to trend up. And while there's no standard definition as to what this means in practice in the U.S., we know that one in four dollars under management are now covered by some form of ESG criteria. Raymond James officially began covering ESG in early 2020, but you've been on top of the ESG and related energy transition topic specifically for quite a while now. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience of this trend from where you sit as an analyst? Did you see this coming? First of all, it's even better than what you described. Uh, It's one out of three dollars under management and not not just one out of four. So... Uh, just to give people a sense of the, um, the scale of, of all this, $16.16 trillion just in the United States are, uh, that's debt plus equity combined, is the total of all ESG assets under management. And that is indeed one out of three professionally managed assets in the United States. It's a stunning number. In two, the, the one out of four, that was two years ago. So in just two years, it ramped up substantially. And, you know, 10 years ago, it it was practically non-existent. So ESG as an investment trend uh, has a long history. It it was called different things, you know, sometimes um, impact investing or um, corporate social responsibility, you know, CSR. But the, the real kind of, game-changing, I think, increases came in the last five years. And that's not a coincidence. Uh, A lot of that has to do with the Paris Agreement, uh, which, of course, was signed in in 2015. So, you know, we've seen this uh, a surge in investor awareness of corporate responsibility, and ESG is just the direct kind of manifestation of that. So, let me also point out, uh, ESG is obviously, you know, three separate dimensions. Paris, of course, relates most uh, directly to the environmental dimension, the E. We should not ignore the, the S and the G. Those are also important. Within that $16 trillion of ESG funds, the largest single slice is in fact climate funds. It's about $4 trillion, just climate funds. These are funds that are mandated to own anything and everything that 
supports the global energy transition. That's not only, you know, clean technology or renewable companies, it can be, you know, banks and insurance companies that are helping finance these projects. It can be, you know, consumer goods companies, for example, that are you know, changing out their um, petroleum-based plastics with uh, bio-based plastics. It can be industrial companies that are making energy efficient light bulbs or automakers that make electric vehicles as a growing part of their sales mix. So it, it is fair to say that uh, Paris played a pivotal role in you know, the, this game changing increase in ESG in the last five years. And also the sustainable development goals, right, which were ratified around the same time with that broader focus on the SNG as well. Uh, I think that's also been been a ma- major major driver of this as well. So let's think about this as an analyst, right? So when you a lot of people think if you're doing ESG that you're sacrificing returns, how does that play out in your experience in your research? The two are not mutually exclusive at all. In fact, you know, depending on timing that that we look at, it's entirely possible that companies that screen better on ESG metrics are, you know, objectively better investments. Now, that's not always the case. And and of course, you know, people like myself have to pick stocks and picking stocks is not exclusively uh, about uh, which company screens the best on on, on ESG. The, The reality is that for the last decade, returns on the stock market have been very tilted towards growth companies. And so that means technology, that means um, some healthcare perhaps, but, but tech was, was the big one. And technology companies tend to screen better on ESG, certainly on an environmental angle, you know, they don't pollute very much. They can have, you know, relatively good relations with their workforce. They're not um, extractive industries. Uh, So in in that sense, that has helped improve the returns of highly ESG screening equities. But look, uh, we have to, uh, we have to pick stocks. And sometimes, Improving ESG metrics is uh, positively correlated. Sometimes it's not. I would say, on on the whole, it it has been positive. And here, here's just a very very simple illustration of the premise. When an investor owns um, owns an equity, the last thing they want is for that company to show up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal with a big scandal. So, what, what companies mm-hmm. tend to have scandals? Well, those that Know, might cause an environmental disaster, or maybe um, an ethical lapse by management, or um, you know, violating laws in, in a particular government, corruption. So ESG helps protect against that, if nothing else. And so that's you know often what we talk about ESG as an additional layer of risk screening, right? If nothing else, that's what you're getting is at a minimum, right? But so let's switch over to, you know, you've, you're mentioned how you think as an analyst picking stocks. How do you, in your practice, incorporate ESG criteria into your analyses? So because my focus as an individual analyst is on clean tech and renewable energy companies, needless to say, the environmental dimension is essentially central. It's, it's at the core of what these companies do. So you know, by definition, a company that makes uh, solar modules or wind turbines or electric vehicles helps improve um, the environment, right? Helps reduce the carbon footprint of its particular industry. But that's not enough. You know, to get the highest possible score for you know, an ESG you know, ratings agency, and then ultimately, of course, you get into the portfolio of an ESG investment fund, they have to think about the, the S and, and, and the G. So that includes 
workforce relations, diversity in all of its facets, corporate governance, independent board, uh, independent boards, you know, beyond what is required by law, uh, helping and, and engaging with communities. So, you know, one, one thing just, you know, to give a specific example, when people think about electric vehicles, you know, they know that, you know, the battery contains lithium. Well, where does lithium come from? Lithium comes primarily from Australia, Argentina, and Chile, but it's extracted in different ways. In Australia, it's called hard rock mining, which is very uh, energy intensive and can be environmentally problematic. In Argentina and Chile, by contrast, it's done through what's called brine, which is just a liquid that comes up to the surface. It's much more benign from an ecological perspective. So there's, you, know, you, you, you do not need to you know, dig massive holes in the ground to extract the brine. So that's an example of how in what seems ostensibly a uh, you know, very clean uh, supply chain, there are companies that do better or worse depending on where their lithium operations are. I think you, you bring up an excellent point, and I swear we didn't coordinate this, <laughs> but that's the exact example we use, or similar example that we used in our comments to the SEC a couple of years ago when they were asking about ESG naming. And, you know, our point to the SEC was, you know, just because a company ostensibly fits in as a solar panel manufacturer, for example, that doesn't mean it's an ESG investment. Right, it might fit. That's in. That's right, exactly right. And you know, the last six months, uh, in fact, in the solar industry, you know, we've seen controversy over the supply of polysilicon from um, Xinjiang province in western China, where the Uyghur Muslim minority is oppressed by the Chinese government, and in fact, I mean, not not just oppressed, but you know, there are credible accusations of forced labor and companies that source their polysilicon from that specific part of China, you know, have had to account for the human rights attributes of their supply chain. So, uh, you know, this is a way of how you know, business can actually encourage uh, positive public policy. You know, if the Chinese government is put under enough pressure by you know, the private sector to change its policies towards the Uyghurs in, in Western China that, that, you know, of course, can have a positive social impact. And so this, this is an example of, again, how a, a seemingly straightforward, you know, supply chain, solar panels, of course, they, they surely solar panels are, are, are green. Well, they, they, they might be green, but are they made in, um, in, in a way that, you know, respects human rights, that's a separate question altogether. And doesn't present additional ESG related risks, right? I think that's, that's just such a helpful example for everyone, especially now there's a lot more focus on the life cycle impacts of different energy technologies. Of course, one of the big topics being the uh, what happens to a wind turbine after its life cycle, the mining example for solar panels or EV parts, electric vehicle parts, that sort of thing. I think it's just important for folks in the audience to really take away that ESG is not this monolithic, oh, just because it's quote green, we're going to put it in the fund, give it a bunch of money, right? That they understand these subtleties and that on the analyst side at Raymond James, um, in your case, you guys understand that very well. And we're busting myths here. (laughs) So I think that's really helpful. Let me switch gears over to this ratings, rankers. You know, we, we work with a lot of our clients want to know how can they improve their scores? And that doesn't mean they're not interested in actually improving. They're also interested in that, but scores also matter, particularly when you're crunched for in capital markets right now, um, in a lot of cases. So which ratings agencies and ranking indices do you find particularly helpful, if any? Or do you kind of just do your own thing internally at Raymond James? 
Well, rather than uh, endorse any any particular ratings outfit, let me just say that you know, as with credit ratings, there are many to choose from, and in fact, there are actually more ESG ratings sources than credit. Partly that's because uh, ESG, of course, is a, is a younger uh, industry, so to speak, right? Where ESG ratings is kind of a younger part of the of the financial community. So there are lots of startups that have their own flavor of how to grade companies using ESG criteria. That being said, you know the the credit ratings are are a good um, analogy. If a company is bankrupt, its credit rating at source one is not going to be drastically better than its credit rating at source two. And generally speaking, that's true of ESG scores. If a company has you know terrible governance, terrible carbon footprint, you know terrible workforce relations, of course it's not going to get a good ESG score from anybody. So mm-hmm. it, it's a it, it's a matter of degree. But directionally, they, they all point, tend to point in the same direction. You know, what, what I can say is, you know, some of the most um, uh, high profile uh, ratings agencies that have data for maybe, you know, the, the largest, most diverse set of companies, you know, this includes um, MSCI, Sustainalytics, Refinitiv, Bloomberg, but there are also many specialized data sources that might have a focus on a particular dimension. For example, the um, you know focusing on um, you know the carbon footprint of you know, measuring carbon emissions of, of a particular business. That's one component of one dimension, the the E in an ESG. But there are there are consultancies that will take you know this this very narrow approach. Most investors out there, except perhaps the most specialized categories of funds, will find what they need from one of these kind of mainstream data providers that I mentioned a minute ago. So is it fair to say that there's not necessarily one go-to that you look at? You're probably looking at more than one and saying, okay, this is generally pointing in the same direction. Is that fair to say? I think it's important, number one, not to get too hung up on the question of, you know, where the ESG rating comes from, because like I said, you know, ultimately it's people, right? You know, this, this is not a computer program that sets ESG ratings. It's, it's just like picking stocks. You know, there needs to be a human being to evaluate all of the data. But number two, the any perspective on ESG ratings cannot possibly encompass every single action of of a company, every single attribute. So Mm -hmm. there is no universally accepted kind of ultimate decider of what is Mm -hmm. and and is not a good ESG score because ultimately investors want different things. I mean, there are, there are funds, as I mentioned, you know, climate funds, this is the largest slice of the overall ESG fund universe, but there are funds that focus on gender balance. There are funds that focus mm-hmm. on human rights. 20 years ago, some of the original, they were not called ESG in those days, but we, we would consider them through that lens today. Some of the original corporate responsibility funds were focused on uh, perhaps a religious or or an ethical model that excludes certain industries from consideration. So these might might include tobacco, alcohol, firearms. In those days, less common to uh, exclude uh, fossil fuels, but you know now, of course, we see more 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 of that as well. So ultimately, each individual fund and each individual investor need to decide which angle of ESG is the most important for them. That makes a lot of sense. And thank you for 
really taking the time to dig into that. I know it's kind of a hard question to, to throw at you. <laughs> we don't want it to sound like Raymond James is specifically endorsing any particular <laughs> framework, of course, but I appreciate you, you know, sort of taking the time to dig into that with me. And I have one more hard one for you before we get to some more, perhaps easier questions. <laughs> Let me throw you another tough one. So thinking about ESG reporting, we know that there's a multitude of frameworks out there all fighting for their market share, so to speak, (laughs) if I could put it that way. But if you could snap your fingers and have every company reporting to a single ESG reporting framework or two, perhaps, which would it be and why? I very much like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They are straightforward, logical, and holistic. They cover everything that needs to be covered. And all of them are important, of course. Uh, you know, clean water is important and, you know, rights for, um, you know, every community are important and you know, climate is important. But if I had to give kind of my, my, my own, you know, maybe two, two favorites from, from the SDGs to the extent that s- such a thing even matters, Number three and number six. So number three is good health and well-being. And if there is one thing we all learned in the past year of the pandemic, it is that healthcare is kind of near the apex of human rights. It is very hard to talk about supporting human development when um, people are sick and dying. And so companies that provide equipment, services, other um, solutions for improving healthcare, especially in underserved geographies and and communities are are very important. And then the second one is number six, clean water and and sanitation. And you know what, This, this again, comes back to COVID. Washing hands for 20 seconds with soap and hot water. We heard this from day one. It seems like a such an easy thing to do. But according to UNICEF, we know that 3 billion people around the world, three out of 7 billion, do not have access to clean, safe drinking water in the place where they live. And three out of 7 billion, this is not only the least developed countries, there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of people in middle income economies like South Africa, Brazil, Indonesia, Russia, that do not have access to clean and safe uh, drinking water. And again, during the pandemic, that can be the difference between, um, frankly, between life and death. I have to say, of all the things I was expecting you to say, I was not expecting you to say the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I'll tell you why, but I think it's just a fascinating answer. The reason I'm surprised is just because the UN SDGs are essentially a government framework, right? Or a multi-stakeholder organization framework. And of course, originally weren't designed as a corporate reporting framework, but this trend is really big. And we've seen all kinds of different guidance coming out on how companies can integrate SDGs into their reporting. So I, I'm just laughing because it's it's definitely the last thing I was expecting you to say. <laughs> but um, I think the goal three and goal six, you're right. I hadn't thought of those as so foundational. But when you put it in the context of the pandemic, and even I'll say, having recently experienced a lack of clean water in Houston for a week during this freeze in Texas, power outages, it is pretty foundational. (laughs) And it's something that we certainly take for granted where we live. So I I appreciate you bringing that up because it's definitely unexpected. But how do you, as an analyst, how are you looking at through the SDG lens when you look at different investments? Not many companies explicitly report their performance on the basis of SDGs, but thematically, any sustainability report will touch on 
many, if not most of, of these themes, they may not be labeled or categorized as SDGs, but by definition, a sustainability report or an ESG report will refer to the environmental impact of a company's business, the social impact, which, which of course pertains to many of the SDGs as well, and you know, both of the positives and, and the negatives. So, you know, things that businesses are doing to that can have a negative impact, they're able to reduce or minimize that impact. And if businesses are helping solve a particular problem, then the, the more of that problem that gets solved, the better, of course. So it, it can be from either accentuating the positives or alleviating the negatives. ESG can be a, a force for change in both of those directions. Let me switch over to something a little more open-ended that I'm interested to get your thoughts on. SPACs, special purpose acquisition companies are in the news a lot lately. Um, There's all kinds of different dialogues you can hear out there. uh, You know, what are the implications for ESG risk management and transparency? Is it better to get more impact-focused companies to market even though there's less transparency on the front end? You know, this is a big topic. I'm just going to open it up to you. Your thoughts on SPACs, Pavel? So SPACs is an acronym for Special Purpose Acquisition Company. For those that may not be as familiar, it's essentially a pool of cash that trades on the stock market. And the goal of the management team running that pool of cash is to find a private company acquire that private company and essentially make that private company public through the merger. From the perspective of the private company, it is a way of getting access to the public market without the traditional IPO, uh, initial public offering. SPACs have been around for, for decades. This is not a new phenomenon, but it is fair to say that in the last 12 months, we have seen an explosion of SPAC activity. I um, can tell you that it, just zooming in on the clean tech sector, there have been more than 40, 40 SPAC buyouts of clean tech companies since the beginning of 2020. Now, obvious question, is that because of COVID? No, I don't think so. I I think that's just a coincidence. But it is fair to say that, uh, you know, we've seen this dramatic acceleration in the popularity of, of SPACs. And look, the ultimate test for a company going public is not the method by which it goes public, IPO or SPAC. There's actually a third one called the reverse merger, which which is less common too. Uh, But the ultimate test is just the performance of the underlying business. So when companies go public, they always give some expectations for revenue and earnings and so on. And then the the proof is in the pudding. Do they meet those targets as, as a publicly traded company? If they do and investors are happy, you know, the stock generally goes up. If if they disappoint, stock generally goes down. It's, it's as simple as that. No major concerns from an ESG perspective then? No, no, no. I, it's, it, it's, a, it's really a mechanical kind of question of just financial tactics, uh, mm-hmm. which, which way to go public. Now, what, what, what I can say is of the 40 fat companies uh, that involve clean tech, half of them, by the way, interestingly enough, involved in electric vehicles. There are many early stage pre-revenue companies. So companies, if it's an electric vehicle company, companies that have never actually sold a car are, are going public. Wow. And you know, before any management team does that in a pre-revenue business, uh, they should think about how to set expectations. Because any pre-revenue business 
is inherently risky, right? Uh, if, if there is no commercial history for an, for an enterprise, regardless of the industry, by the way, of course, there is a higher risk profile uh, to that. And that needs to be taken into account when um, setting expectations for the investment community, because managing a private company does not typically involve having to report you know, every single quarter on the performance of the business. But if, when it's a public company that's uh, having to do an earnings call every single quarter, you better believe it. If there is a disappointment, management will hear from investors and maybe more to the point, watch their stock go down. Thank you for that. Pavel, I have a last lightning round of questions for you. I'm going to ask them all at once and you can just share your thoughts as they come. What most excites you about the ESG investing trend and the clean energy transition? What most concerns you? We've seen talk of an ESG bubble or even a clean energy bubble. Do you think those concerns are well-founded? Like I said, ESG is not only about the E. So talking about an ESG bubble would not be a a meaningful concept because it, it can involve so many different dimensions. Now, clean tech specifically, as a as a sector as, of of the market, you know, had phenomenal performance in 2020. The average clean tech stock was up 200. percent Now, that's in part because of ESG funds that have been piling in, especially climate funds piling into these stocks. But there are lots of fundamental drivers too, like the European climate law and the commitment by China for, for net zero. You know, these are fundamental drivers, of course, for um, the underlying businesses. So the only concern I have about ESG as an overarching trend is that there is not a uniform definition of any of these things. Now, you know, I said a minute ago that you know different credit agencies can have different different perspectives. They generally you know, coincide uh, to to some degree. But just to give you an example of how kind of little foundation there is for some of these definitions, you know, the concept of green bonds. The real what, what, what is a green bond? Anybody can issue a bond and call it a green bond. <laughs> There is something called the Green Bond Principles issued by the ICMA, International Capital Markets Association. But that's not a government. They do not mandate. They have no power to force anybody to do anything. So companies can call themselves green or sustainable or climate friendly. And it's like a proverbial slogan. You you can neither prove it or disprove it. And so you know, hopefully there will be some uniform reporting standard, maybe the centered on the SDGs, maybe something else, but it would help to have a degree of consistency in how this is all being done. That's something I try to stress to folks in all industries. I know there's heartburn in a lot of circles about standardized ESG reporting um, from the, uh, you know, potentially new guidance coming out of the SEC. And I just tell folks, that that's a good thing. It does not matter what industry you're in. That's a good thing because it helps level the playing field. You know, and I think a lot of companies that tend to get maybe bad reps for perhaps being in oil and gas or, you know, having a business that's dependent or part of that supply chain, in a way, automatically disqualify from something or another when in fact, if you actually looked at the ESG profile, they're actually outperform companies that are not. And so I I think it's good for everyone to have some sort of standardization because it helps to level that playing field. So we'll see what comes out of (laughs) next steps there. But there is, um, for those of you listening, March 2021, there is a request for comment out again from the SEC There was one during the Trump administration, which we responded to, and there's a new one um, with the new Biden administration. So it's a good time to get folks to respond and 
provide comments. This is all happening live, right? This is evolving in real time and good transparency and, and standardization is it's a good thing for everyone. So let's just end on a fun question, Pavel. During the pandemic, a lot of us have been doing binge watching once in a while. <laughs> what's been your favorite Netflix or I guess Amazon? What's been your favorite TV binge during the pandemic? It's not technically Netflix, but I have been a Trekkie for a long time, going back to the next generation era nice. in the 90s, and then, and then Deep Space Nine, and then Voyager. And now it's Star Trek Discovery, which is um, available through you know, streaming services as well. And you know, it's a great show. And you know, of course, what's funny about Star Trek is every decade, the technology that's shown on the show, in theory, shows kind of the same, you know, century, you know, 300 years in the future or something like that. But when we look at the old Trek episodes, the computers that appear and, and even the, you know, the, the spaceships look so primitive compared to what you know, people use today in real life. So just watching the optics and the, the, the production values of technology improve over the years in, in a matter of not centuries, but literally just a few years or, or a decade is amusing. But you know what? Star Trek's a very uplifting show. Even when it you know, deals with uh, serious issues, it always you know, has a positive message of inclusion and people working together to solve common problems. And, you know, we've all needed that for the last 12 months. That's for sure. That is for sure. And I have to laugh because the, you're the second guest on ESG Decoded that has brought up Star Trek <laughs> as a good example of, well, in, in this case, a little different, but Jackie Lyles was on a few weeks ago and she mentioned they do scenario planning in Star Trek. <laughs> so I appreciate very much that that was your example today. Maybe it's a trend. We won't tell anyone. We'll see what the next guest says to get more Trekkie fans on. <laughs> All right. The, the more the better. All right, Pavel. Well, thank you very much again for your time today and for sharing your thoughts and your uh, really incredible experience in this sector. We've been very grateful to have you. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you for listening to ESG Decoded. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you consume yours and follow ESG Decoded and Global Affairs Associates across social media platforms. Until our next episode, take what you learned today to drive long-term value for your organization by doing good for people and for the planet.